Okay, thank you, Isabel, for the nice introduction, and uh, thank you, thanks to Matthias for, for giving me the opportunity uh, to present the work here about what we've been doing. And I would make maybe one little uh, addition. I don't think that uh, Matthias uh, rekindled his passion in programming. I think he was always interested in uh, programming. And I was actually quite surprised to see who reads my source code and then to find out that Matthias is actually uh, reading source code. Um, so I'd like to start off with a bit uh, of history of Manlab software. So I'm going to talk about uh, software. And I think the best way to describe this is by, by looking at a spectra, but this is not an actual spectrum, but it's actually uh, citations of publications uh, over uh, the, the publishing date. So, and I guess the first one was 1989, and we heard this already in the morning session from Albert, this deconvolution um, algorithm um, um, that it had. Then uh, the next one was in uh, 1994, the, the sequence tag, um, which uh, uh, it can be used to, to identify uh, peptides. And then in uh, 2002, there was this uh, Nature uh, paper with the high resolution mass spec to analyze the Plasmodium falciparum. Um, uh, um, uh, and, and then there was the protein correlation profiling, um, again a Nature paper in 2003. So this relied on a, uh, a software that was written in a .NET uh, in environment and uh, this software was actually called MS Quant. So now you see three peaks popping up because um, the, the software was already used but it wasn't until um, sometime 2000 nine uh, until uh, the software was published, but um, uh, this software was essentially used in the phosphorylation side, uh, scoring the cell paper, which uh, again used the Fusida uh, database. And now you see that there's this uh, big peak here, and this is the um, Max Quant um, paper, which is the, 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 widely, uh, the, the most widely used amongst these. Uh, and then in uh, 2011, there was the Andromeda search engine uh, in um, 2014, the Max uh, LFQ paper for, for quantification, and in 2016, the, the Perseus uh, uh, paper for getting a better interpretation of the data. So I, I guess what you can see, and I guess this was what my initial statement was about, there's a long history of, of, of software and algorithms in, in Matthias's group. And of course, the big question is like, what comes next, and what could be the, the next generation of, of, of software? Um, and so to start, we, we had the, the idea that there wasn't actually a, a slide that showed the, the workflow for, for proteomics. So I have a very, very uh, simplified um, workflow. So you start with a project idea, you have your experimental design, you run the samples, then you process the samples, and then you try to interpret results. And once you have some understanding, you might go back to the experimental design and, and change your um, uh, experimental conditions. And what I'm going to talk about today is, is the alpha pept idea, so a, a software idea for processing samples. And as you were already introduced to Alberto, he's going to talk about the clinical knowledge graph, graph uh, Philip already hinted at, uh, which is aimed towards the, the interpretation of, of the results. So I'd like to start off with a bit of developments in software. So, so what, what's happening outside in the software world? And I think one big thing that's happening is that companies actually go open source. So if you think of the big machine learning or deep learning um, libraries like Google, Google has TensorFlow that, that's open source software. Everybody can look at the source code. Same goes for Facebook. They have, have PyTorch and even old companies like Microsoft, which were always the, the um, antagonists to, to open source projects like Linux nowadays have open source projects like the, the open source visual uh, editor. And I guess it's clear that, th that it comes with a lot of benefits. So you can have faster development cycles, you can have much better quality of your software because you have much more people interacting with it and being able to, to test it out, and you can build a community with that. And I guess it's very beneficial for science because this enables an infrastructure for, for reproducibility. So we nowadays have tools like, like GitHub, so, so pages where you can uh, um, exchange the source code and it really means you go read a paper and in principle if the, the code is open source you could go there and if you want to understand how a graph was made you could change the code, make some adaptions and then see how this would change the results. There are also tools for continuous integration like Travis CI means like if, if you have changes in your program that you try to, um, to, to, to make the, the, the programs 
uh, work even for fur further generations. There's a big effort in containerization. You have things like Docker, where you, where you essentially freeze your environment in a, in a virtual machine so you can use it at a later uh, day. So the idea is really that uh, you will always be able to reproduce results that you once calculated. And also there are cool tools like JupyterHub, the, the notebook system where you put code and, and text together um, in a notebook system that you, you're able to share your data and you're in a much, much better shape to share how you actually achieved the, the results and, and, and share your data processing. And there are even combinations already like Binder. So Binder uses Docker system and in JupyterHub. Jupiter so basically to freeze environments with JupyterHub so that at any time you can re-run uh, your experiments and, and your data evaluation. And what I think this enables is really enabling open science, but also like reproducible science. And another big point is the adaptable science because if everything is open, I think it's, it's very nice to go in, just make some changes and see what, what changes would this make. So if you look at what are popular languages in terms of development, so I think that's always nice. So if you search for language tutorials, um, I found a recent survey that's the Popularity of Programming Language Index from September 2019. So number one right now is Python. Of course, you could argue if people searching for language tutorials maybe just means that this language is hard to get into. But also if you look at a more competitive level, for example, if you look at Kaggle, Kaggle is one of the leading websites where people have competitions on, on what's the best performance in data sets. So if you ask the, the Kaggle people, what programming language do you use on a regular basis? And um, so this survey is from uh, the Kaggle Machine Learning and Data Science Survey from 2018. So a lot of people actually say, say Python. So Python has, has a big popularity. And I guess this is due to this, this Python ecosystem, which is really nice. So you have a lot of libraries and, and, and you have a lot of libraries and frameworks where you can do a lot of things. You have like machine learning libraries. I already mentioned PyTorch, Botorch for Bayesian optimization, TensorFlow, Pandas for manipulating data. But they're also super fast in adapting new algorithms like XGBoost, which is uh, winning all the data science competitions right now, or, or things like for plotting matplotlib or matrix uh, manipulation uh, uh, and, and NumPy for uh, interacting with matrices. So what you can do at the end of the day is you can do a much faster development with possible, and you can also do um, a lot of rapid adaption. Um, regardless of this, there's always this idea that, that Python is, is really slow. So it, it's often seen as something like, like the glue in between. You have a C library, and then you build a Python interface on top so you can use it. So the question is, um, can we use it actually to do the heavy lifting? Can we really build something on Python? And I think we can. Uh, and this is where my background comes in. So I, before that, in, in my PhD, I did actually super resolution microscopy. And I did it in the, the group of Professor um, Dr. Ralf Jungmann, who's actually sitting in the, the audience um, over there. Um, so there we would do a super resolution microscopy and, and there we had a Python software. So this Python software was spearheaded by uh, Dr. Jörg Schnitzbauer, who was a postdoc at that time. And he, he uh, said at the end of the day before, the, before he's able to learn all the tools we have, he could just rewrite everything in Python. And at first I didn't believe him, um, and I was actually super surprised on how quickly he was able to transfer all the tools we had in MATLAB and LabVIEW and in Excel to Python, and I, I got super interested to see how we can make this progression. And the cool thing was actually that things got super fast. So a typical task is the image reconstruction, so you record tens of thousands of images, and you have spots that you need to fit, so there's 2D Gaussian fits that you do, and then you end up with, with numbers like having 100 million spots you need to fit. Um, and if you optimize it, you can easily get 100,000 fits per second on, on a CPU. Uh, fits meaning here 2D um, Gaussian fits uh, on, on images, and you can even translate it to a GPU system, and then you get up to 5 million uh, per second. So if you're interested in that, uh, you can always uh, check it out on, on, on GitHub. So the big question, of course, is like, how can we make things fast with Python? And the, the answer is this here. Uh, th this dragon, so that's actually the symbol of the LLVM compiler. So that's, that's a backend for a C++ compiler. That's um, on what the Apple infrastructure is based in even fast languages like, like Julia. Now you might ask the question, so how can we use this with Python? And again, there's a package for that. That's, that's, that's called number. So I, I hope I was able to tell you that, that Python can actually be a tool to do the heavy lifting work and, and the hard work. So the question is, how can we translate this to mass spectrometry? 
And so, for example, if you want to, to start a workflow like the, 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 the task of a search engine saying, okay, we would like to do the matching part. So you have a recorded spectrum, and then you have a theoretical library, and then you would like to compare it, saying, okay, what, uh, what peaks are within a certain a threshold and encounter hits, so you, you compare them against it. And for a typical healer test run, you have 5 million database entries, you have maybe recorded 100,000 queries, so you have to do 60 million comparisons. So if you do this in Python, it will take you roughly two and a half hours to do all the calculations. If you use the number compiler on, on only one core, it's always parallelizable. It, it just takes 60 seconds. And if you then translate it to a GPU, the, the whole task uh, takes 10 seconds. So, so what is enable is, so for example, you want to, to search for 10 spectra. On, on one core, it takes five milliseconds. So this is really like um, a range where you can then easily do real-time instrument control because it's such in, in, in such fast processing times. And if you build a workflow with that, so for example, um, that's the current implementation, if I have a raw thermal file and I want to get the table with ident identified proteins, so I, I load a data set into memory, I do the, the um, peptide spectrum matches, do the FDR calculation and calculate the, the protein groups, it, it takes right now 3.5 minutes if I do the calculation of, of one, on one core, which is of course scalable if you want to use GPU or, or um, multiprocessing. So I guess that's, that's a good requisite to say, okay, we want to do something fast. So we thought about we, we would like to build a Python ecosystem, a framework where we can use all this, those nice packages to really have a nice framework to do it. And we thought about the name AlphaPep. So just to, the name is, is actually a pun because we were looking at all these packages and saw, for example, Google. Uh, Google has this mother company named AlphaBet. And then we said, okay, we're working with peptides, so maybe we call, call this one AlphaPep. Uh, and then we were thinking, okay, what do we want if you think of this constraint triangle? So we thought, okay, it should be super fast because it's always handy. Python is cool because then we have a modular high-level language where we can do everything. And um, it should be open source because I guess that's the, the best way to ensure quality. If everybody can see what you've been doing, can contribute to, to that and then make changes. And the idea was really to say, okay, this could be a framework for the community to be able to quickly adapt the latest advances in computer science for the upcoming year so that we really have some test environment where we could test this. And in terms of interfacing, we thought, okay, if we want to address the average user and, and not just the, the bioinformatician, we want to have some super easy interface. So ideally, just something where you could just drag and drop your data and in this uh, triangle, press one button and, and do the whole processing. And so the, the graphical user interface actually looks like this, actually. So it's just one window where you can drag and drop your data in it and then press start and then we'll do all the number crunching. Of course, we have all the, the, the settings hidden. So the, the idea is to have uh, expandable menus where you can, can do all the, the selections so that you don't um, get distracted in the beginning. But of course, we, we thought of, of different concept, uh, concepts of interfacing. So we, we think of the regular user will get a graphical user interface, classic drag and drop, one exit file to do the installation. But of course, there, there's an, and it's a command line interface if you want to build automated workflows uh, and ideally for all the programmers, we will have the, the, the source code on, on GitHub to have a, the package so that people can contribute. We would like to really um, implement all those cool tools for continuous integration so that everybody could take the, data, the code base, try new things and see whether they make things better or worse. And then, of course, you could ship it in a standalone installer or the whole um, uh, in a Python package. So the question I would like to address a bit is, so why should we do this all in, in Python again? And, and why does this Python e ecosystem help us actually for, for, for implementation? I would like to highlight this with, with two tasks. So one task, for example, is like the question, what is a good score? So in the beginning, I was thinking, okay, what, what, what scoring system should we include in the search engine? And there are like several stores we could correlated, we could calculate a hyper score, we could just simply count the hits. But what you have at the end of the day, you have a sequence and you have hits, certain properties or, or features and you get a, a score and you can check whether it's a decoy or not. And one idea which is uh, already well known is to, to actually use machine learning to decide which are the best features. So that's the, the percolator idea. There was an HM methods paper in 2007. So the idea is like we use, use all the features. Um, to let a machine learning algorithm design what would be a good feature. So why is this cool? So I guess you're all aware that recently we, we now have, have deep learning tools where you can actually predict intensity 
Um, so this would be also something where you could say, okay, now we, we take an additional column, the predicted intensity to maybe get a better score. So, so how would this task help us in, in Python? So I already said you, uh, I already told you that what's being used is a port vector machine. It's a machine learning algorithm. And in Python, you have libraries, and what you can do is you can just benchmark all the recent advances in machine learning algorithms to see um, if there's any algorithm that would do the task better. So what you see here is, whoops, this was one too much. You see the relative test accuracy compared to the support vector machine and the relative execution time. And you see that the support vector machine actually takes quite some time, so this is due to its nature, because it scales uh, quadratically with the sample size. And Recently, so what, what's really getting interesting is, is machine uh, is, is deep learning, it's the, the perception architecture or the, the, the decision trees, the random forest. And if you can, uh, and what you can do is just like use the libraries, test all the tools, and then you find that you actually can speed up your computation by just switching or adapting one of the newer algorithms. And so, and actually, if you do that, just to, to give you an idea of what this does, so if you have 36,000 um, peptide spectrum matches and you use this support vector machine uh, to generate a better score, you can actually get plus 30% in, in peptide spectrum matches. But it also helps you with, with other tasks, for example, the, the LFQ, um, uh, the normalization tasks. So for example, the, the, the initial paper is a levenberg marquois optimization, so that's a standard for nonlinear least squares. And if you think of the development in, in, in nonlinear least square solvers, Python has a, a, a plethora of algorithms. So you could just exchange this. And, and this is really in Python, it's just instead of saying, um, we want this LM, we, we pick another one so you can benchmark to all of them. And then you, you see things like this. So this would be the reference again, the mean squared error. So how accurate is this? And what's the, what's the optimization time? And there you can actually see that uh, it's also a fairly recent development. It's called Kubila as an optimizer, so it has a third of the, the error, so it optimizes much better, but more importantly, it's 500 times faster than the initial implementation. So for you as a developer, you only need to, to change one parameter, and then you can try all those new, new uh, algorithms. Um, on another hand, Python is really, um, this Python ecosystem is really nice for a uh, community package. So, so why do I say that? What you can do is you can really write maintainable code. So what I said is we're relying on all the packages. And this means we have code that's heavily tested and one can focus on the domain knowledge. So we don't have to worry about whether this least squares implementation is correct or not, but instead we can think of, of the MUSPEC implementation. And so that's very cool. And, and we already had this, and, and the, the idea of um, standing on the shoulders of giants, and this is what you can actually see. So if you look at the GitHub, so what, what they have is they have a list of direct contributors to a package, but you can also show the de dependency graph. So what it does, it shows all the developer that, that helped contributing to this library. So then you see things like this, and maybe you have like six direct contributors, but you have 20,000 uh, indirect contributors, and I guess this highlights on how you can really leverage this, this uh, common intelligence to, 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 to make better code. And again, to put this in numbers, um, so you can do all the re-implementations with a minimum number, uh, uh, number of lines of code. So for example, the search uh, I implemented is just 500 lines of code. So the database generation is just 1,000 lines of code. Feature finding is just 1,500 lines of code. So if you want to get into the code base, it's much easier because it, there's less code to read. It's much easier to do uh, to define a test uh, sco is, um, test scope because you're using packages where you assume that they're tested. And of course, in terms of optimization. And another cool thing is, of course, um, that the packages usually come with with general solutions. So it, it's not, not a two-dimensional solution or three-dimensional uh, solution, but it's most of the times n-dimensional solutions. And this is, makes it much easier uh, if you have, let's say, an extra dimension like the, the um, i-mobility that you want to include, um, because you don't have to rewrite everything, you just go for the n-dimensional case. So if you think of task um, having like match between runs and then you just put an additional axis uh, that works uh, like it is. So I want to give you a little peek on what's happening next. So I actually just uh, um, joined the group. So in March I, I started. So this is where we're here in, in October. And um, I would say we're making good progress right now. So we want to, to get this, this um, first version of, of the alpha pepped out in this year. So ideally on, on GitHub, this will be a version for, for Tamil raw data. 
Uh, and for the beginning of next year, we'll be uh, working on the, the Bruker adaption. And with this, I'm at the end. Thank you for your attention.